I've just flown in from three days in New York, which I'll just reference to start with, because we spent, uh, as a firm, three days talking about just one thing, which was our, our purpose. Is that, you know, the history of my firm is that it was born out of crisis. It was born out of uh, disaster in Chicago, which led to a realization that there was a lack of coverage for insurance. Looked at this. I'm not a climate change expert by any means. In, uh, what I feel I know a little bit about is uh, the problems of risk uh, and risk financing. So that's the angle I'm going to just address uh, briefly. And I'm just going to talk about uh, the four agents, if you like, uh, that are party to this. I'll start with the climate itself. Now, we've, um, uh, we've done a survey uh, with base of uh, people's attitudes to this and the general acceptance and, and indeed a major concern coming out of this and our work for the World Economic Forum that climate is a big issue. So in general, yeah, we'll get it. It's going to be a major source of disruption uh, and danger and cost for, uh, for enterprises. And if I broadly defined it, you know, natural catastrophe adding up to all the other uh, risks, some of them fashionable like cyber, some of them old fashioned but still of great concern to property uh, and people uh, that are out there. So you know, the climate speaks and it, it adds to the general sense that volatility, if you like, risk uh, after the golden pre-crisis period is very much back on the agenda. There's then, I'll call it the risk industry, that's broadly defined as banks, insurers, uh, risk advisors like ourselves. Uh, where do we stand on this? And you know, my sense is, in general, we've got the message, and you know, both from a commercial and a wanting to do the right thing from a sense of purpose point of view, are investing a lot. So in my own firm, we've just taken on as a non-executive John Hurst, who's the CEO of the Met Office, uh, to give us some extra capability, uh, both in general and specifically with respect to climate. Uh, we've invested a lot in uh, you know, the debate around uh, resilient repair and uh, government policy more generally around things like uh, flood re and pooling of, uh, of risk. And there's a but at the end of that sentence, uh, which just let's be realistic about some of the aspects. So the first, um, the first point I want to make is that you know, going green, if you like, the avoidance agenda, uh, regrettably in some ways, is only tangentially related to risk. So I would love to have a way of giving economic incentives to people for doing the right thing with respect to uh, things like uh, non-renewable consumption. There are things like resilient repair which do impinge on your future cost, but in the main, it's outside of uh, our economic scope. So while we participate in things like ClimateWise and we're in, uh, enthusiastic advocates ourselves uh, on, in the Carbon Trust, uh, it is hard to come up with meaningful solutions from a sort of purely business point of view in that regard. The second point which is just worth noting is that the very act of insurance, of course, uh, obviates the need to be concerned. If we had perfect cover for these things, it would have removed the incentive to uh, avoid in the first place. So I just note that, that fact, and that doesn't make the avoidance, uh, the, sorry, the cover wrong, but nor does it deal with the root cause. So let's just have that in the back of our minds. And then a final point is that we're all uh, in be beneficiaries and some vic victims of perfect data. Data uh, does some strange things, which I'll come on to in a second which is it makes certain risks uninsurable. If from your DNA or from your postcode I can tell certain things that are uh, going to happen to you, then it becomes rather illegitimate to pull you with people who don't share those risks. Let me talk then about the government. The government clearly has a, a big role to play in the, the German floods, for example. I think it was an 8 billion euro bill uh, in the last years. That starts to become a societal, a government problem that goes beyond the means of the individual insurance. But governments have some problems. There's obviously a temptation to defer investment given the time horizon of, of the, the UK parliamentary system or indeed to privatize the problem and try and make it somebody else's uh, as best they can. And then there are some poor policy decisions, I'll come on to one or two of those in a moment, that have uh, in other countries like Florida and the US house insurance that make things worse. They encourage people to do the wrong things, it's sort of a moral hazard problem and that leads to problems. Then finally, businesses themselves, well, you're obviously, you get it, again, in our survey, dominant uh, response around the worry about climate change exposed directly. This is, of course, an event about London, but London is a hub with routes that spread out uh, around the world in various ways, and those 
supply chains, infrastructure, data, other connections that business here relies on, indeed the population relies on, give you an exposure that is uh, global, not just uh, to the uh, immediate, um, immediate uh, environment. And I will make a broad statement that my exposure so far to our clients is that uh, while there are lots of contingency plans around particular events, we're next to the Thames at Tower Place. We have an extremely detailed operational plan for what we would do to evacuate disaster recovery centers, etc. But not many firms have then linked that to some of the financial impacts. So these things go wrong, uh, particularly in the modern world of social media. They tend to go wrong very quickly. There's a doom loop you can get into, and you don't have long to act. So you need to think hard about financial as well as operational uh, considerations. So rattling through that, when I, I talked about the problems of data, well, you could crudely say there are two types of natural catastrophe, and I divide those into the unpredictable uh, storm, uh, hurricane-type uh, issues, for example, and the predictable. And the predictable tends to be things like flooding, which has been more directly relevant in the UK so far as an issue. And that's caused by data. You know, we're now pretty well able to map flood risk. And the problem becomes, if it's unpredictable, then actually insurance applies very neatly. There have been a lot of investment in capital market solutions, catastrophe bonds. Uh, in the predictable, the problem is what do you do when we know that certain postcodes are essentially going to carry a cost attached to flooding, and how do you uh, handle that uh, without causing moral hazard? If you insulate the people there from the problem, you obviously need to make sure you don't encourage more building in the same place. This just references what we're doing. So I mentioned resilient repair, uh, our investments in this regard. So we have a, a, a lot of commitment to natural catastrophe as a whole. And this is really a mixture of advisory uh, activity to try and help people think about business interruption, supply chain risk, and then insurance cover. And there's a lot of activity in this space. If I talk about the government, I'm going to talk about, uh, I can't resist talking a little bit about flood re. I note, of course, it excludes businesses, which uh, we'll, I'll come on to in a second. But we were involved in the debate around flood re, though not the final design. I mean, my sense on flooding uh, is a, an example where you do need some form of pooling. It's a shared problem where, subject to a degree of randomness, you need to make sure that those most exposed can get cover. The problem we have is predictability, which means that insurers inherently will be reluctant to insure certain postcodes. That leaves something like 200,000 households without cover. That's not acceptable to a society, so we have to find some way to force that cover to happen, so enter the government. Uh, the, the, my problems with the scheme, I'll just note, are that what it essentially does, I mean, it passes the costs, it privatizes the problem, if you like, it passes the cost of the insurance industry. I don't have a problem with the insurance industry paying particularly for uh, immediate flood costs. I worry, though, about the fact that if the government doesn't have direct skin in the game, will a, any given parliament be willing to live up to its commitments to do its bit? Because prevention has a sort of seven to one uh, financial gain over, uh, over cure with respect to flooding. I worry, of course, about any precedent. I'm sort of vaguely libertarian economist. I don't particularly like unnecessary or windfall taxes and imposition of levies. So it does that, which is a slightly regrettable precedent. Probably the, uh, the bigger issue for me is that it creates an unnecessary complication. It's a new vehicle. That vehicle requires reinsurance. That carries a cost, we estimate, 150 million a year. That will be borne ultimately by policyholders, and in particular, policyholders who are outside of the flood zones. The biggest problem I have uh, singly with it, and indeed one or two other government schemes, including by the one they're about to introduce into the school system, is it doesn't charge for risk, it's a flat charge. And one of the, if you had to say what's the one golden rule of finance we should have learned from the crisis is charge people for risk. If it's a property risk and a mortgage, if it's uh, to do with lending, or indeed to do with insurance. And a flat charge leaves an inherent uh, moral hazard of people, builders, developers, local government, looking at floodplains, thinking, why not? Um, the arbitrary exclusion slightly worry me. So, you know, band H, well, they're rich, they can afford it. It's not normally the job of the insurance industry to make, make value judgments on wealth. And more importantly, from my point of view, businesses, so small businesses who are often locationally most trapped, you know, pubs, leisure, those sorts of things are excluded. Uh, look, commercially, it means that people like us will try and fill that gap, but it, uh, it strikes me as a, a questionable uh, decision. And then, finally, I look at the 
you know, I take that package and I just think it's ripe for unintended consequences to happen. I'll give you a simple example. There's no mechanism for making uh, resilient repair. It actually, gives, if I were living in a floodplain and I were that way inclined, I might think for a couple hundred quid a year I can have my carpets and furniture replaced at the government's expense. Indeed, the, it'll be the other, uh, the rest of society's expense. So they're going to have to introduce rules that say things like, if you don't do this, you're out of the scheme. So in other words, the government gets to tell you what kind of carpeting you should have and where your plugs should be based, etc. It, it feels a little bit like a, a, an unappetizing consequence to have thought through. So if you're setting up schemes, be it for flooding, for uh, health, for schools, think through the consequences is my advice on that. And then just you know, to make this real, I'll uh, skip over the detail of this, but the poor design, this is the cost of crises to the US uh, taxpayer, and you see them rising rapidly over the decades and getting very lumpy. That is in part, uh, in large part, because of uh, not charging people the cost of risk, which means that you get that sea view, and if the worst comes to the worst and there is storm damage, it gets repaired. So it encourages building in the wrong places, which is something uh, we strangely like to avoid. Let me then uh, move on just to fi finally talk about firms. This is about businesses and your own resilience. And I've got a couple of observations here. So the graphics are going to be a little bit complex. It's data from our own, uh, our own firm and client base. But the first point I want to make is that the, the riskiness inherent to firms is very different. So we see when we look at the claims count across clients over many years, this is based over several years of data. It just gives you the distribution of clients according to the claims they see, the losses they're incurring, you get a factor of like 10 between the best and worst. So in other words, there's a lot you can do to make yourself safe through decisions you make, your risk management procedures, and clearly a lot of clients are not, and they're relying on insurance uh, for the gap. And that's fine insofar as it goes, but my suspicion, and uh, I have some evidence to back this up, is that if you're suffering that greater degree of risk exposure, you're also running risks with the, the health of the firm as a whole and losses that might go beyond the ability to insurance to capture it. So there's a lot you can do to look at your individual exposure. And then secondly, you need to think about this in a much more dynamic way. Insurance has historically been a very static decision that we have a certain exposure, we have a certain cover, we're fine. I don't think that's true anymore. I think you look at the cycle of impacts like the online retailer ASOS recently uh, that happened to BP during their crisis. When things go wrong, they go wrong very quickly. This shows you some cash flow impacts. And in this particular case, we reckon this firm, with a couple of climate events coming their way, had something like two weeks of cash to uh, survive. And they need solutions that work that quickly to maintain the confidence of investors and customers. Because if you don't have that, you get into a vicious cycle of decline. So from a firm point of view, do things to make yourself resilient, but also make sure that you're able to withstand a, a rapid series of shocks if something does go wrong for your business or indeed for your supply chain. So with that, just to summarize, yes, climate change is real and present danger. Uh, it will indeed uh, conspire with other risks potentially to uh, lead to sort of crisis scenarios, crisis situations that you need to be thinking about. So as a business, uh, my, my general take is we find a lot of people have not yet got all of the things they need in place to be sufficiently prepared to survive the impact and potentially the, the cash flow squeeze that comes with it. So you need that, you need a recovery plan that is not just operational, it's in, it includes reputational and financial considerations within it. Uh, with respect to the government, you know, the government is clearly critical in all aspects of this debate, uh, but that, in my view, have been some poor choices around uh, design made in pool schemes that they need to uh, think through. And if they don't get that right, it can have some unfortunate uh, uh, consequences. And uh, anyway, in, with respect to flooding in particular, it's, you've been left to your own devices, which is uh, in general something I welcome uh, with respect to governments. Uh, but we, that means we do need to act. And then from a risk industry point of view, a lot being done. We've also tried to be influential on things like the government debate and policy choices uh, with it. I will say, like many other areas like cyber, I'm old enough to remember Y2K, there's an awful lot of hype to scrape through. And I think it's important the industry gets beyond that and gets down to some nuts and bolts of things we can actually do uh, to make a difference and help uh, you and your firms uh, survive and thrive in a more volatile world. Thank you.